Hey guys, Semphis here. Just a friendly Canadian reminder to keep forest spying, and uh, you're watching Thorin's YouTube. Oh, by the way, uh, one of your teammates I haven't asked about, so I'll ask about him now, is the player Alan. So this is a guy who has quite a unique um, background too, because he also actually came up after you, like years later. He was the one who wasn't with the original crews, they came up, and then he became obviously like a player in this team for many, many years. But the thing yeah. is, people will know, outwardly, he's a very quiet player. This isn't the player that would do interviews or that sort of thing. But I will point this out, Valley. I noticed that a detail people miss is this. Even when later on, Get Right and Forest came over in the era when you went out, they still tried to keep this guy in the team. Team. So that tells me that he was like one of those players that other players rate and think is good and think actually like should stay in. So who was this guy? Who, who, who was Alan the, as a player and teammate? Yeah, and uh, I would also put him in the same category as the rest of us that he would slot into any team as the third, fourth or, or fifth player. He was really good, but also on the same page as the rest of us. I can see it now. And that's good that we can see that the progression and the development of the roles makes sense. Because I can see it now that, you know, we had similar players on all of the roles. Um, so we had, uh, he, he was very similar to the rest of them, to Robin and to Tentpole and, and to me. You know, you could always count on us to be a good anchor or support player. But when it came to star player or... Um, or entry, uh, it, that was uh, none of us, unfortunately. Um, and Alan was also a very uh, important part of the chemistry puzzle. I don't know, we had some sort of strange vibe and chemistry in that team where we really liked hanging out together and enjoying each other's company and you know doing this thing together i think that all of us saw the journey that we were on as something we we were doing as friends too you know we had a lot of fun um doing well, pretty sweet, Valley. i was at some of these events obviously when i was working as the editor-in-chief i used to go and do the interviews etc and i have to say back then like for example when people see all this like falcons drama now for example I, part of me just thinks Valley, like they are they don't know what like those polish teams were like back in the day where like i've actually seen them no joke almost have like a fist fight go back in the game and win the game like the, back then people obviously were a lot less professional i have to say in this particular team i don't think i ever saw people argue people actually had sort of like quite sort of jokey sense of humor and people kept it quite light i felt like yeah and um i'm not uh, actually sure as to why that came to be i think that it was just a mix of people and and i think maybe some of it also falls on me and robin because we were uh we were strict and authoritative leaders uh who uh, showed people how it's done right um and um we we did also have had to have these types of talks where uh, if we're not doing things that aren't good enough or we need to develop or someone is fucking up, we had to have, have these talks too, but we always had it in, I feel like, the right context and in the right format. Um, I, I guess maybe that's a Swedish thing too, to be able to, okay, uh, not let your emotions get the better of you. And I, I, I can feel like that there's a lot of players. I watched um, the player camps on the tournaments. There are a lot of players who are not good at keeping their composure, you know. And that's something that was important to us too, you know. Right. Uh, the energy and the vibe that you're sp spreading in the team. Um, there's a time and place to do certain stuff, and and that's uh, that's well, something I'll, that I'll, I think... maybe I'll give you an example, and you can play off it. Like the obvious example I'm thinking of is you do see a lot of players on the player cam now. If they fuck up or they lose the round, they act like uh, sort of angry, like oh fuck like that. But I, I do often think myself, Ali, like yeah, but what's like your young teammate who maybe just came in the team thinking yeah. who sat next to you? Know, like that isn't that going to like affect his mental state or his confidence? Yeah. You know, I would uh, if I were a coach or. Um or a manager, I would be very strict with right. uh, how how the players are um, supposed to behave. 
when they are playing the game and how their body language is and their composure because that type of energy spreads in my opinion and yes and like you say it's it's also gonna set bad precedents too if you if you're one of the more senior players and you're behaving poorly nah, i don't think that it belongs in the in uh in a match setup it doesn't belong there Yes. One player I will, I do want to ask you about it. I've got an interesting setup for this one. Is when you said, like, I kind of agree. It's actually one of the reasons I also wanted you to be the opera. Like, like, you did kind of lack the big star player. In fact, I, back then, I even often used to describe it like this. I think it's the same in most team sports. The reason the superstar players are the superstar players and they get paid the big bucks is because, yeah, the team is what gets you to, like, a final. It gives you a chance to win. But the difference is, when you have the Forest or the Zet, they could just win you the game themselves. Like, they, they just take over the match, whereas the problem is, if you in that close match you don't have that player it's hard it's fucking hard to win so one player that definitely at one point potentially fit this was when you guys got Gox from Fnatic because if you remember look I won't say the reason why even now all those years later because I'm just legit like that but there was a, let's just say there was a personal conflict in Fnatic and even though they had this super team Gox got like ejected from the team and he came to SK because no. obviously he's the other main rival and when he came in look he himself was only there like a, a, I think something like six or seven months because if you remember he went back to Fnatic afterwards and like the drama thing could continued again mm. but when he came into this team I know like I actually remember even spending staying in a room with this guy I know he was like super motivated to try and show them like for that like hey like I was good or whatever or like I'm as good as you or whatever like at the time he came in would you consider him like a star talent what, what do you think of Gox <clears throat> yeah I think that in in our setting he was more of a star player um yeah he demanded more space and had more freedom and also had the uh, capabilities of you know performing uh, he's a very doing, confident guy, if I remember as well. Like he was one of those guys where, like, I think he would had been like a hockey player, or something. dude. He he thought he was the shit. Like I think he thought he was like yeah. better than people. I like, get right. I'm not even joking. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm not totally sure if uh, if he was a, a, a perfect fit for us either. Right. Um. I I, I don't remember, but um. I think that uh, I don't remember what year that was. But 2010. Yeah, and and that was when we started you know we had been declining for too long uh in my opinion and gux even gux couldn't save right. us from you know that 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 was uh that's my perception that we were peaking of course uh, 06 and after but in 2010 i think we were quite we had played together for too long and uh you know we had almost been there for too many times uh and i feel like the motivation was not as good as it should have been and and when gux slotted in uh he was a really good player and uh, i think that we 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 uh, had to demand more of the rest of the team to be better for that to work but we didn't have him for long right I have no, a question. Yeah, go on. Good player for sure. I have a question that's a little bit about the org. Because again, from being inside SK, I have a unique perspective. I actually knew some of these people, what they were like. And I can tell you from talking to Alex Muller, the slash, the guy who still to this day runs SK Gaming, if people don't know, the German guy. He, not only is he like a super old school guy, and by the way, his main focus is obviously business. He's not like a guy from like Counter Strike or something. He comes from Quake back in the day, if people don't know. But what's interesting is I actually always admired this aspect of him, Valo, which is because he's a businessman, he actually did always understand the concept that you have to delegate to people who are experts at those things. And so interestingly, I actually remember back in the day from talking to him, his approach, as far as I know, to the Counter-Strike team was he had a couple of guys, I think it was you and Robin, right? He had a couple of guys that were sort of his guys in the team. These were the senior players who got their top salaries. And part of the requirement from him was like, this is who I go to talk to about if we need a roster move. Do we need to shake something up? What are our expectations? And so what I would ask you is this, fella, is what was that like dynamic like? Because it's actually quite unique, like I said. It's not like every team. Not every team worked that way. Some some teams really did just have a squad and they were off here and they played and occasionally they'll email you or tell you, good, but it's not that close. And then the other thing is, like I said, baked into that to me, though, this is the part I found interesting was that guy had very high expectations, though. Like he did, he really wasn't a guy who was like, it's cool to come like second or third. He wanted to have champions. He wanted SK to be the biggest dog in the world and to have all the rest of the players. So what was it like? Was the pressure? Was there expectations from SK? What was the dynamic for you? Um it's uh it's a bit strange because um back then there was sometimes it wasn't super clear as to who was in charge. 
not in any of the teams. I think that uh, they left too much control over to us, right? And and to the players to you know to take initiative. And I don't think that it's good because it puts a lot of pressure on us to you know do more than we're supposed to. Uh, which happened in in almost all of the teams that I played in. You know, you you took more responsibility for everything that happened than you were signed on to do. Um, and I think it's much better now. Uh, and I think it's healthier in any work environment to have like a clear boss or leader, someone who is gonna take responsibility and call the shots be that the coach or the team leader or the general manager. I think that's really important to have. Um, and I think it was a mistake not having it back then because they, I think most organizations just put their trust in the players and yes. for good or bad too, you know, uh, but I, I would say that doing it with us was, you know, it was okay because we had a, we had a, sense of uh, uh, duty to to the organization but m- maybe it shouldn't have been us right you know it, right. it would have it would have been better to have someone that was external like a manager or a coach or no one ever told the team either that you know Vale is gonna you know have the the last say in uh, in this stuff he is the one that's going to run the team, and uh, you know right. you're going to. It wasn't made explicit, him. right? No, and if it had been, that would have been better. Ah, uh, I see, because, right? Because I, I feel like everyone is happier when you know the exact terms yeah, yeah, of, sure. a, the hierarchy, of a profession. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, I think that's important for, and that I'm happy to see that that has changed too. So I, I would say that back in the day, they, I think they put too much. Um, they they put too much responsibility on the on the players in all of the teams that I've been a part of, uh, from SK to to uh, NIP. You know they would maybe uh, engage when you do good or you do bad, but not in between. By the way, aside from, like you mentioned, for example, obviously you could have gone to SK straight from NIP with people like Robin back in the day in Spawn, etc. Like that, there's moves that people do know, but are there any like latter day, like in this period when you're the in-game leader, I'm guessing you don't really consider leaving because it's like it's your project, you're the one running the team. But like, are there times when Valet could have gone to a different team and, and maybe role swapped and been a star again or something else? Was it, were there offers out there for you? Uh, I don't remember having any uh, concrete offers. Uh, for that maybe there were but i i don't remember and uh, i guess that i consider that that i you know back then th- there was only national teams basically so you didn't really entertain the thought of playing for a danish team or you know uh, an american team if i had gotten the question i probably would have entertained it because you know i love the us too and i might have ent- entertained you know going there uh, but I don't think that it happened. And also, I did um, see myself as in one of the best teams possible too. So I was I wasn't actively looking for other um, other offers. And and also, I would have never joined Fnatic back then. Uh, it and I don't I like the guys and uh, you know, but I'm a competitive guy. I. Uh, I played against them for so many years, so I would uh, I would never have joined them. Oh right, it feels like bullshit if they beat you to just join join them. Essentially, like it's, it's like oh, cheating yeah, almost yeah, at that the, point, the, right? <laughs> I'm a very um, um, I pr- principle uh, guided uh, man, right? So that that would have been against my principles, you know, okay. competing against joining the enemy. Yes. Um, so back then, I would have never done it. I think that I would have uh, said no on principle. Not that they asked. And I don't have anything against the guys. I'm I'm actually really happy today that, you know, Forrest and Get Right have done the journey that they did. I'm really happy too for Karn that he actually got to, you know, develop uh, beyond sure. uh, being yeah, in yeah. the team. 
but that's that's the thing about growing older i guess you know i can be happy for other people instead of you know sure. just yeah, sure. just being frustrated sure <laughs> What about, let me ask about a few of the other teams of these eras, so you get your thoughts. So you referenced it earlier, but we were only talking about World Cyber Games. And obviously when the Poles and Neo and Taz and those guys came along, they were like a revelation. Like if people don't know, they even had that very weird pattern where like they would somehow always peak on the fucking majors. Like aside from that, they might sometimes even come like seventh at a tournament or just be like be okay. And then when they went to these big majors where they were underdogs, especially against Swedes for some reason, they were just demons, mate. Like, and the reason that's so crazy is I don't think any modern fan can ever appreciate this in the same way as Sweden was the top country in the Nordic region in general produced the elite play like obviously Norway had some amazing players Denmark had these great teams Poland wasn't even on the like metaphorical map like Poland was irrelevant if you played an online game before these guys against some Polish team you just assume you're going to win that game like there was no famous play- like yeah Neo got like a little bit of hype initially before like, they set that line up but again that was just like online games or like a Euro Cup or some small land in Latvia or something that no one gives a fuck about like the yeah. idea these guys would come and not just be good but like win the world championships is like that was like revolutionary I remember what was it what was it like to compete against these guys for so many years yeah, uh, and I think that maybe uh, it was mentioned when uh, Taz was on your um, was doing an interview with you too. It's it kind of feels like they came from nowhere and they were instantly good. Yes, because maybe they had been putting in that time and been grinding. Um, it sounded like that to him, and when they got the chance, you know, they took it. Um, but. They were a they were a really really good team, uh, and I also feel like most of the teams during that time that rose to, you know, to be to, to become dominant, they had kind of an era where they were defining metas and they were coming uh, like underdogs. And I think it always takes some time to figure teams out, especially back in the day when you didn't have the. Uh, demos to analyze and you didn't have the assistant uh, the the anal- analyst in the team and you know all of these resources um it took some time to figure out some of the teams that were you know defining metas and uh, and having errors like pentagram is one of them and uh, i would also put neo back in the day he was also we're talking boris level on that it was like uh, okay if is, is neo gonna have a good or a bad day that that's gonna decide you know win or lose so that was kind of frustrating uh, players were so dominant sometimes back then like neo was um so i think he carried a lot of uh, wins for them like forest also did but it was uh, it was really tough to play against them same as forest you know you basically felt like you were going up against Neo sometimes, and he would twenty or twenty-five frags. He would win the clutches, and he would win the match for for them. And and similar to to Pentagram having their era and their defining metas and coming with Neo, I I feel like during those years we had MTW doing it too, and then we had MIBR with Kogu. Oh sure. You know, there was always like uh, uh, every year or every second year, there was this new team defining metas and, you know, playing with a new play style, having new star players. It was really hard to adapt back then to, to uh, you know, you go into a tournament and then you, you meet like a really, um, a team like Pentagram who has really good momentum, you know nothing about them and, you know, that's, you're done. By the way, uh... when you when you were because uh, obviously, like we say, you have this hidden thread that you could have yourself just been an opera the whole time, and you could have done that role. What did you think of some of the people who were your peers, like the Korgus and the Frods of the? Because these were like the legendary names back then. Whoever watched the demos <laughs> of, and they had the six skills. Did, were these th- were these the best opers for you? Uh, I think that uh, Kogu was the best for a period of time. Uh, I would definitely definitely put him up there. And also, I would put Markelov up there. Sure, sure. Because that was also like, you also lost the games to Markelov when they had like one or two years where they were yeah, yeah. Re- really hard to play against. And and he was a big part of it, you know, 
back then the op was it, it was so much deciding with uh, entries and multifrags and yes I would put Kogu and Markolov at the top for 1.6 in my opinion it was they were the worst guys to play against for sure and then on rifle it would have been uh, Forest and Neo for sure by the way, in general, again, similar to the Paul story, the Navi story is crazy too. Like before they made that one lineup, they used to have good teams. They had the Hellraisers team and the DTS team and a A game. But the difference is when I say good, I mean like go to a tournament and maybe they make the playoffs, you know. Yeah. When they made the Navi squad, they obviously won all the majors out the gate. Like you say, like Mark Love was considered like number one player in the world. Like what was it like yeah. for this team to come along? Yeah, it was uh, It was so strange during that time. It was like, uh, like I said, it was like eras were happening every year or every second year so it was really tough to play against and if i would go back and you know like i said 06 would have been the time that we could have been the best but after that we were always like chasing one of these guys and um i think what was uh, really hard back then was that you always got surprised with new playing styles and new metas and and that's probably happens maybe less now because Counter-Strike now seems like you have the same type of setup with uh, all the utility now. So there's maybe more of a pattern. But back then, uh, you know, you could get surprised with uh, losing to the same execute five rounds in a row if they invented a new flash, you know. Yes, so that was, you know, frustrating for sure. And and I would also blame ourselves for that because we never, we were not the team that were defining the metas. We were the team that were, you know, getting hit with it. <laughs> sure, sure, right. And no, now we were, they, they were a beast. Um At the end of 1.6, they were a beast for sure. Navi and Pentagram, they are... The kind of teams that that would haunt my dreams, you know, my Counter Strike dreams. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, since this is a question no one ever asks, I want to ask you: since you're an old school player, and I know you are someone who has put a million hours into Counter Strike and been in a server a bazillion times, even when it's not at the pro level. Here's my question: What was your favorite spot on any map to play? What's the more? What's like the, when you think of CS and you think of the best, the most fun times, the best time, What's like the spot that you like to play that you think of that would be associated with that? What comes to mind? That's a good question. Um, I think that's uh, what I think of instantly would be maybe train on the. I think it's the A site with an op uh, looking at Pop Dog. Oh, the classic on the train, the, the the three train or whatever it's called. Yeah, I, I yeah. remember that. The bomb train, basically. Looking at the yeah. Aladdin one where they jumped down, right? The classic yeah. one, right? The classic angle. Yes, that was, the upper uh, spot, basically. <laughs> a fa- a favourite. <clears throat> and we used to play spawn. Um, you know, the first spawn goes here. So oh, also right. The, the tower on train. Yes. Uh, or nuke. Um, is it called CT Red? I think. But is it blue nowadays in uh, in? Uh, you mean the outside United? area? Yeah. Ah, right. Okay. That was also a classic 1.6 yes, angle yes, where you would sit with, yes. with an op or uh, on the pistol round. That was the the highlight angles. Sure. By yeah. the way, are you someone where if people look at your career, you actually have a very, very weird abrupt end to your career because what happens is you're in this SK gaming team a bazillion years. By the way, it's I'll point this out. This team was never bad. Like it was always like at least the top three, four team in the world. In fact, most yeah. of the tournaments even, towards the end even, you're still in the semifinals or you get to a final. You even win the yeah. odd event every now and then and sometimes beat yeah. the top teams. And then what happened was you had one of those scenarios, Valley, where like essentially like it's hard to blame the org because I'll give you the example. This happened to NIP a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, that Swedish player Nork was in NIP, right? He was an opera yeah. in NIP. But then if someone comes to you one day and goes, sorry, Nork, but uh, we can get device. The joke is he even told me he himself was like, well, yeah, you should. See, yeah, I'll off then. Like, say, like, what can you say? So if someone comes to you and says, um, we're getting Get Right and Forest from um, Fnatic, it's like, there's not even any point arguing. Obviously you are like the best players in the world. You've won everything, right? When this happened though, obviously someone has to leave the team though, right? The perception is you 
you got pushed out or the players decide among themselves. So give me some thoughts there because the only thing I wonder is, like, I got the vibe you still wanted to play. What, were you, did you feel like people, did people betray you? Did they just not pay, think you were a good player? What happened in this scenario, mate? Uh, I don't remember who replaced me in, uh, in that lineup. Uh, I remember that uh, it was after a dream hack that um, I... Um, I had a team talk with them, and uh, and they wanted to try another player, and um, I I don't feel like I feel backstabbed or anything. Uh, I can see why why um, because I think for the for the last years that we were playing together, we weren't competitive enough. Right, uh, and. And one can argue, was that on me or was that on anyone else? But uh, anyway, in the end, it was me who took the fall for that, I suppose. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, maybe, uh, you know, I could have stayed and it could have been someone else who left, for sure. sure. Um, I don't actually know the the full reasoning behind it. Um, And... um, yeah, I, I didn't really feel betrayed. I I also felt like something new had to happen. And and also if the players, you know, back then and probably also now, the players uh, have a big say in. Yes. And if they feel like they needed a new in-game leader, um, I'm not going to argue with that. Right. Uh, because I, I feel like either... Either I have the trust or I don't uh, in a team. And so uh, <clears throat> what happened after that is um, I actually, I could have gone to another team, but I chose not to because I, I felt like the decision was uh, natural. You know, the results weren't there. The motivation felt like it was declining. I didn't want to jump into another team and, and not feel motivated in that either. So I ended up doing some some casting with uh, Heaton, actually. So we were really early on that before yes. Twitch and yeah, stuff. Yeah. So, so yeah. that was sick. And obviously, and it to... goes out saying it was a Swedish stream, but guys, it was in Swedish language, right? Um, I think we, we might have done English too. Oh, really? Few, okay. We did a few of them. Fair enough. Uh, I, I don't remember, but um, I did that for a while, and um, I was actually at one point I was on my way back to the same lineup, and and I know I don't think that anyone has talked about that. No, no. Uh, but at at some point they wanted me to come back uh, the team. You know, after I left, okay. they asked me to, uh, can you come and practice with us? We need someone for this, and and after that, when I did that. They said that we would like for you to play with us for the next event. But I think uh, actually uh, SK stopped it from happening. The okay. team wanted it and I I was up for it. So my comeback never happened because I think that SK stopped it. Um, right. And, you know, there's no grudge for me uh, on that. And what, what I ended up doing is... Because I'm a very competitive guy, uh, I feel like um, I didn't want... Uh, what I decided was I didn't want to become a des- desperate and I didn't want to taint my brand or my name. So I decided to quit while I'm still you know, considered yeah. to, to be good. So I, uh, I decided to let that you know, be the end of it. And not become desperate and play in worse teams, and you know, become right. and um, taint my own legacy. Yeah. I was uh, proud of it, so I decided to okay, it's uh, I should do something else because uh, if I can't play for the best teams and if I can't be the best, I don't want to do it. So I, I decided to, to do something else instead. 
Right, obviously at this time period, nobody had any clue where esports would go. I mean, the funny thing is, actually, the time period when you left was actually when people thought maybe esports was in trouble. This is when we, we still had just come mm. out of the financial crisis at the time. Yeah. Not Even the top teams didn't make that much prize money. It's actually one of the reasons, if people don't understand, why people like Zet did go and take that CGS offer, because you got way more salary than you ever would play in even the best team in the world at the time. Like, you could get yeah. $20,000 back then. $1,000 a month was a big deal. I remember in SK, I think yeah. the salary was like 1400 that was the, the top teams in the whole world no one could know that in about five six years you would get this crazy scale where yeah. people went to like 5k 10k now obviously there are people on like forty thousand dollars a month which is inconceivable for professional like no one could know it but what are your thoughts on that because obviously you were the generation that kind of missed that wave you were just before it yeah and um i don't mind it either I'm uh, proud to have been the first generation professional gamer who slept on floors and also who maybe paved the way and hopefully was an inspiration to other aspiring gamers. Uh, so I'm, I'm proud to have been part of that and I don't feel uh, bi bitter to have missed out on the, you know, the big bucks. Uh, and um, I would say, you know, I never did it for money and uh, none of us were making a lot of money. We were the, uh, the opposite. You know, we were losing money doing it. Uh, so that was never the, the driving factor. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy that it's, you know, it's moving in the right direction because I think that competitive salaries and at least salaries you can live on is important because we didn't have that. Uh, and I also think that it's, uh, it's a bit too much in a lot of the teams. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... If, if we're talking like thirty, forty thousand dollars a month for some players, I would argue that they are not worth this no, no, type of money not. because they're not bringing uh, enough value into the organization yes. to to be paid this much. Simple as that. You yes. you know you might have a few star players that are such a big brand that they're gonna bring so much traffic. Um, and bus to an organization that they you can motivate that, but there are very few players. So I think it's it's getting a little bit out of hand, and people are people are expecting too much money for too little work, in my opinion. And and again, it's from a former professional player, so I I totally get that people don't like me of course. saying that they should do more. But it's the reality of, you know, that's the reality of real life, of uh, businesses and partnership. And, you know, prof if you want to make a profit, uh, the, the ones that are paid this amount of money needs to do more for, for, their, sure. for their income. By the way, one other thing about your era that I actually think is kind of cool, because the funny thing is, they don't even really do that that much in modern day CS, mate. Like, they'll sometimes do the event, like they have the IEM in Sydney, for example, and go to Australia. But nowadays, I know, even though the next major is actually going to be in China, actually a lot of Counter Strike now is just in Europe, mate. Like, actually a lot of like the things in the meantime, there aren't even that many events in America. In your era, you were actually in the golden era of when, like, you have loads of events in Europe, but then you have these big events in America. And yeah. then actually, you were even in the era when it expanded. And there were the events in China and Korea and I can yeah. tell people myself when I went to some of these events like back then this this is a crazy culture shock I mean I'll give you the obvious yeah. one value when you first go to one of those events in China and you go to the toilet you know what I'm talking about it is literally yeah. a hole in the floor like yeah, you, you walk yeah. in like where's the toilet like that, <laughs> no one prepares you for this you just walk in yeah, when yeah. you go to Korea you are just like holy fuck is this like Blade Runner or something? there's all like the neon signs yeah. it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of wild right? give me some stories you must have some fun stories about all the travel that you had got to do in, the, in these years yeah, and and I agree too. You know, it was. Uh, I think that's <clears throat> what I carry with me the most: the fact that I got to experience a lot of different cultures, and see a lot of new places, and meet a lot of new people. That's what I uh, always try to, you know, bring up as the positive. Sure. If I had not done gaming, I would never in a million years <laughs> be able to do sure. to do the stuff that I did. Um, no, but I loved going to the US, you know, going to LA and New York for the first time. 
Uh, New York ended up being a, a favorite for me, so I, I continued going there, and I, I've been there maybe 10 times. Oh, okay. I, I, I love the U.S. I'm very uh, American uh, sized from movies. When I was young, we always watched movies, so Gosh. I love the... I love the U.S., um, so I really enjoyed going there. And um, one uh, one cool thing that we did, we went to Korea for a tournament. I don't remember what it was, but we actually stayed there for six weeks in Korea and lived there and played a tournament. And then we went to China and played a tournament there. And after that, we went to WCG, I think, where we lost to MTW. Oh, right. So okay. we, we were gone for, uh, I think, two and a half months. But still, it was like, it was still the, the sense of we were getting to do something extraordinary, yeah. something that was fun and new environments uh, with good friends. And that's the sick thing. And, and I don't want people to misunderstand me about it because we always put... Uh, performance first but in the end uh, we got along really well and I think that in our teams it must have been the hierarchy and the leadership in the teams that that we really uh, put the group together uh, very solidly and with a lot of chemistry but we still you know we knew that we're here to play and we need to put the time in and and that's what also bugs me today about, um, you know, some of the changes in teams. That you don't like them doing the quick, like chop and change. Like you bring a guy no. in and he fails, you kick him out, right? No, I don't like it because I've I've seen some old interviews too from when we played, and we were like, uh, you know, we were okay with not going to the final every time. We could still see that it was a good effort. We did our best. We know what we have to work on for the next one. And that's what we did. We didn't, you know, swap a player just because we didn't go to a final. Uh, and and that kind of bugs me now that um, I feel like the GMing isn't that great, right? Because they're putting together a bunch of people, but they're swapping one or two in yes. two months. Uh, and and that has to be on the GMs and and also if if uh, I would also see uh, look at it this way that if you want to build a relationship to the community and to the fans and build some credibility as a an organization, it's uh, it doesn't make sense to to not give it more time for a group to come together and you know produce results. I think you've been talking about the same. In one of your videos, you know the three month uh, yes. uh, or six month yes. window. Yes, I, I agree with that. It, it's impossible to throw together a group of people and, and expect results within, you know, two months. Like basically, it, the reason I made that as my concept, my principle, it takes three months to know if a team is actually good or not. It's because I was sick of what you're saying. Someone making what looks like a good move, but then because the first lad it fails or the first two lads, and then they just go, no. it doesn't work. Whereas, like, I, like I say. Sometimes the best teams of all time didn't win the first tournament. Sometimes they even yeah. bombed the first tournament and then just took a while to get the chemistry, right? Yeah, and sometimes you have to go through the bad too True. to to get to the good. Yes. Uh, and if you do that as a team and as a unit too, you know, you go through the bad and you learn and you also learn how the group works and you know how everyone ticks. That's what's going to create chemistry too. You know, actually giving it time and actually, you know... That's what people say about, you know, failure. You know, it's it's just the road to success, you know, yes. having these failures. And I feel like uh, it's uh, it's not good um, performance-wise for the organizations that are so short-sighted. And I also think that it's a bad work environment. And it's also hostile. And it's it's not good for the player's mental health to, you know... That um, how it works is that you get in, put into a team, and if you don't perform right away, you're gonna get cut. Sure. You know, there's no trust in that process, and I, I don't think that's how you make uh, um, teams that succeed. 
By the way, along these lines, in light of the fact you didn't just come back like, hey, like I'm following the game again, guy, you've come back and a lot of the things you've written about have been about these topics, like setting up teams, social aspect, how orgs are run, coaching, like you say, lineup issues, etc. Right. The obvious question is, Valet, are you interested in coaching or something like this? Is, is this a role you would like to potentially take on? Seems like you're thinking about those topics. Uh, I think that I uh, I would like to try coaching. Um, I think that I would be good at it. Um, maybe not from a from a um, only a gaming perspective, but from building a team and a unit and building chemistry and setting the right expectations and and structures. From that point of view, I would like to try coaching, and I think that. Maybe GMing is something that I would like to. Uh, I, I would like to try it. I think that I would be good at it because it's also um, one of the, you know, I, af, after Counter Strike, I was uh, the leader figure for a long time in uh, in Counter Strike in my teams. And uh, uh, after Counter Strike, I ran my own business where I had uh, we had 50 employees and we had. Uh, a turnover of 5 million euro okay so we uh, what uh, what's interesting to me is building uh, uh, team environments and making sure that people are set up for success and i'm also interested in in doing things the right way you know treating people the right way and 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 also trust me on i've tried most of it I tried, you know, the hard way and the hostile way, and what I came to uh, uh, as an insight for me, it's that when people are on the same page and they feel loyal to to you, the organization or the project, that they feel loyal to, that they want to perform right. for you, that's when you get the best results. And and that's something that I, you know, it took me a few years to realize that not being this aggressive, hostile boss, demanding, demanding, demanding. If I got people on my on my side and made them believe in the project and made them feel loyal to me, you know, that we have a relationship. That's where where um, where I had the best employees in uh, in my business. I will say it's a very Swedish insight. It's like let's just let's just be cool to each other, all get along. That is a very, <laughs> that's a very sweet. It's on it's on brand for that way. Well, no, this yeah. then you've obviously that's another thing I, that you clearly do care about is, and I know all the old school Swedish players do, right? Fans, if you're out there, even if these people don't follow CS anymore, I can tell you all the old Swedish pros do think it's a travesty that there isn't like an elite Swedish team right now that can win like the major and be the best in the world. Like they all think it's a travesty because it's not like this is the worst part of it, isn't it? It's not like there's just no good players it's like oh it was just our generation no no the problem is they're all off elsewhere like pro lands in mouse sports and yeah. orcs and apex and and some of the maybe some of them are in eyeballers but not all of them you know what i mean and it's just the talent yeah. spread out so but yeah. why is it important to you i mean i would say it even fits in with the branding angle valid it's a pretty cool way to yeah. brand if it's like we're yeah. an all swedish team and especially if you are a fanatic or someone that has the history right why is it important sure. to you that there's a there's a, a good swedish team well, the uh, to first of all, when I came back to gaming, I was uh, away for twelve years, and I I couldn't stay in gaming because I was so busy. I have two kids, I had uh, fifty employees, and I ran my business, so I had to make an active choice not to be in gaming because I would have ruined myself, right. you know, being all over the place. So when I came back to to uh, gaming uh, last summer, summer of twenty three. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing that I thought was, where the hell are the Swedish teams? Because I didn't know that we don't have right. that we don't have any <clears throat> Swedish teams. So I was like, I was shocked at, uh, and and that ties back into what Counter Strike is to me, and um, and to a lot of people, fans, and community. And Counter Strike has such a rich history and the legacy of Swedish Counter Strike players. So that's why I think it's important because it's uh, it's almost uh, synonymous with Counter Strike to me, yes. the Swedish scene. So I think it, it creates like a void, 
uh, of uh, you know missing the old days and missing uh, Sweden on, and that's really beautiful because I, I'm not the only one you know who who has this type of connection to, and I made a point of it in a tweet too that you know uh, for a lot of people the first connection that they made to Sweden at all is through Counter Strike sure. because Sweden yeah, yeah. is a really small country. You know, it's a, it's a blip. The joke uh, is Swedish Counter Strike should almost be considered the sleeper, like main Swedish export of the last twenty five oh, yeah. years, right? Yeah. Kind of is, yeah. It kind of is, uh, and <laughs> and uh, you know, it's it's a big deal when you start, you know, thinking about it, and and I think it's it's really uh, tough that we don't have a, a tier one or two tier one teams in uh, from Sweden. And what I've been ranting a little bit about is NIP, um, and and that's when it comes to, and I like the guys at NIP. I, I want to point that out. They have some good guys over there now, with uh, Eric Vandel and Threat and Exist is a really good pickup too. So I, I believe in the in the people, and I like them. Uh, <clears throat> what I don't like about the choices that NIP made was. NIP has the biggest legacy of all the organizations, and it's they're known for their Swedish Counter Strike history and legacy. And I think that from a business and a brand perspective, it doesn't make sense to throw that away to go into international lineups that aren't tier one. So that's the problem that I have had with NIP. It's better to stick with the Swedish legacy and right. the history, because that's brand identity. That's yes. something that people care about. Uh, and if you're going to throw that away, okay, but then you need to replace it with, you know, star players, tier yes. one. Uh, so that that's the problem that I had with uh, what they've been doing. I, I didn't really, it didn't make sense to me as to why you would walk away from Swedish Counter-Strike to, to go, uh, you know, mid international lineup uh so that's that's sad um and i hope that they you know nip i i think it goes to show how strong of a brand that everyone has built over the years that people still you know want the swedish team in nip even after everything so i'm they're they're lucky to have such a strong fan base to ask a question towards the end now about legacy, I'll set it up this way because it's rare I get a chance to do this. I actually will sort of brag a little bit, which is even though I'm not going to pretend I ever saw any of this in esports, for like I would, I myself would never have predicted it would get to the point where you could get 40k a month and people are making like fucking. I mean, I could never even imagine Twitch would exist or any of these things. None of us could back then. But I will say one thing I do feel a bit validated about is I did always actually treat the game as if it was like a sport back then. In fact, I'll even tell people some of the players used to think I was a bit too nerdy, mate, and I was too serious and be like, oh, why is it, you know, like, who cares about some tournament two years ago? What about what we're doing now? But I always did get this vibe, like, because yeah. essentially, my vibe in Couch was this, like, this is my sport. Like, I grew up, obviously, with football and stuff, but it wasn't, like, my favourite thing. I never vibed with anything like I did with, like, Quake and Counter Strike and these games. So I used to actually, I did used to treat it like the legendary SK with Heaton and Potty. That's like the fucking Red Wings dynasty in the NHL yeah. or something from the 90s that you all nostalgically remember. And so I have to say that part, I actually think I sort of was ahead of the times on that. Like now people do look back. Like if I'm, if we're doing this interview, they're not just going to think he was just a guy who played a video game 20 years ago. They're going to think of like the big players. Like when you said those names, Markelov, Spawn, like these are like Titan figures. They are like Pele yeah. and Maradona. We all do kind of, we all, I think, kind of think of it that way now. We, everyone's got on board with like the historical aspect. So in light of that, it wasn't just like a blip on the radar that you had a career you had like a big impact you were in amongst all these giant battles as you say all these eras of the elite teams you were the ones battling them you were in the final playing these teams or teammates with some of them what would you say what do you think your legacy in Counter-Strike is how would you like to look back and, and what would you like people to think about Valley when they think about Valley, the Counter-Strike player um, I'm not exactly sure in the beginning I, it was important for me to to uh, have a uh, the community with me as i said you know i was a big part of it and uh, i would like for my legacy to be not yet written okay Bold. so that i i have uh, i've done the professional gamer thing 
and you know that's uh, I take pride in being first generation professional gamer, and uh, I think it's a privilege to have an impact on people's lives. You know, it's silly. Uh, I'm I'm really happy that people care about what I think or what I do. It's a, it's a privilege, and as I said, I now that I'm older. And I have kids, uh, you know, I have a different mentality. What I would like for my legacy to be is to, you know, um, develop the scene or industry in a positive way. That That is what I would like for my legacy to be. And that's that's what I'm going to try to work towards. And, you know, one part of it is helping other brands develop to, you know, find their way. And maybe it's... Um, it's that I do something on my own, if it's an organization or a team. But what's going to be important to me is that we that we actually do make a difference. Sports results isn't the most important thing to me nowadays. Uh, you know, making a difference for maybe uh, the next generation of gamers, uh, making it more accepted for their sake, or helping them on their journey uh, on their um, battling mental health and stuff like this. That, that's where I would like to do a difference. I believe in karma, so I, I have to do good to okay. to uh, to get good also. Okay. <laughs> At the end of this interview, do you have a final message? Do you want to say hello or thank you to anyone? Um, I just want to say hello to everyone, for sure. And uh, and I want to give a big thanks to everyone who cares, you know? Uh, like I said, it's a privilege that, that people care what I think and what I do. And, and I'm, I'm uh, trying to do some, something with it. And I am uh, also uh, just want to open the door to anyone to reach out to me. Um, that's what I try to do nowadays. If anyone wants to ask me questions about esports, gaming, business, life, whatever, uh, my door is open for that too. Tack så mycket. Tack så mycket. Hear me now. Because the thing is, I wouldn't be able to get all the work I do without my brethren, the man dem in the Skrilluminati, my Patreon community. Because this video, like all of them on my channel, is kindly supported by Frisky, Matt Pugnaccio Racula, Ahmed Haju, Jensen Gore, Tobias Berners-Gorny, Animosity, Toucan, Tosh, and you know it, a special thanks always goes out to Jerky's Minion, who always has my back. Would you like to ask a question in my regular AMAs? Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest I could take in my work? Do you want teasers? Find out who the upcoming guests are going to be. Maybe you want to be part of those lengthy esports discussions I do with my top donators. Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today, where? Via the Patreon link in the description box below.